Do you read Stephen King? Good news, there's a club for you, the Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound in the Consequence Podcast Network. First, I want to say uh, hi and hello and thank you to all of you who uh, who check out this podcast every single week. I know there's a lot. There's a new episode every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's a new interview with an artist, and I always appreciate you listening. I, I really appreciate you subscribing. So if you're not a subscriber, it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists and learn about new artists, uh, discover new things, or, or just keep up with what's going on in music. So, uh, And hopefully you'll take this moment uh, to hit that subscribe button. Of course, you can find us at all the usual places like iTunes and Apple Podcasts, at uh, Spotify, at YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just type in Kyle Meredith with, and, uh, and we'll take care of the rest from there. Deliver multiple interviews straight to you every single week. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, it's one of my all-time favorite artists, Jim Ward. I'm talking about Sparta. It's the first time he's done a Sparta record in 14 years. Uh, the last one came in 2003 with the album Threes. In fact, as far as Sparta goes, there was, there was a trilogy of albums, Wiretap Scars in 02, Porcelain in 04, and then Threes rounding that out. Uh, he's kept busy since then, though. He's also got his sleeper car project. He gave us a solo record uh, back in 2011 called Quiet in the Valley. But this is sort of his return to, uh, to heavier music, which is a sub- subjective term there. Heavier doesn't exactly mean what it might have meant 14 years ago, what it might have meant 20 years ago or more when he was in at the drive-in. So we're going to be talking about that and some of the fan reactions that have uh, come along with hearing these, uh, these first singles, Believe and Empty Houses and, and Miracle, and then how the record all came together. I mean, it's, it's sort of just a flash of brilliance, as he'll tell you, uh, recording down in Sonic Ranch. It all happened very, very quickly, which makes for a really interesting story, especially once you hear the album doesn't exactly sound like it was done quickly. I mean, it, th- there's a lot happening on this record, which makes for a really interesting feat that he's accomplished. <laughs> We're also going to talk about what it's like to be an artist in the current situation when there is a global pandemic happening, something that none of us have ever dealt with. Uh, here you've got Jim, who is a... Uh, Launching a record, which of course comes along with uh, with putting the tour out there, obviously has been postponed and canceled right now. Uh, Jim also owns a restaurant. He he's on both sides of this thing, so I want to ask what that's like and what he expects the future to to look like. You know, at least the uh, the next few months. But I'll say with all of this, he's still an optimistic guy. Uh, not only in how he talks, but also in the songs he sings. You can hear that even in the song titles, Believe, Miracle. As it turns out, two songs that were written 10 years apart. So we're going to talk about the importance of optimism and how it lands on this record. He gives credit to producer uh, David Garza and some other famous friends as well. Jim Atkins of Jimmy Eat World, Carlos Arevalo from Chicano Batman. And we're also going to talk about, well, there's a line that's said several times in this interview. There are no coincidences, whether in the songs whether in the artwork, and I'll tell you, it looks like an amazing coincidence. I'm going to leave it at that. I kind of get into this interview and everything. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Talking about the album Follow the River, it's Kyle Meredith with Sparta. Howdy. Well, I got to say, first of all, how excited I am to hear the word Sparta and new album again. Uh, It's been a a long time, not that we haven't been keeping up with your solo career, The, and the, you know, the record that you'd done a handful of years ago and what you're doing in Sleeper Car, but Sparta is something special, at least to me. So having the band back in play, uh, that's a big deal as far as I'm concerned. And the new music sounds great, so compliments up front. Thank yeah. you for, well, A, thank you for caring, <laughs> and B, thank you for listening, and C, thank you for saying you like it, which is awesome. No problem, man. It's a different, it's a different thing, you know, after 14 years, but I'm hoping that people will follow the curve. So, well, let me hit on that, then. It's a different thing. What exactly does that mean for you at this point? How, how is it different, other than, you know, you're 14 so, years older? Yeah, I mean, that was probably the main thing, is that I'm writing from a perspective of 14 years difference. And sort of, if you think about it, the last Sparta record, which was Threes, 
that was still in the progression that I had started when I was 17. I started at the drive-in when I was 17. You know, we toured a lot. We made records a lot. We went straight into Sparta. Same thing, like same kind of like band dynamic, all for one, one for all. Going to practice spaces and like hammering out songs, I would sort of bring in these big chunks of songs and then everybody would kind of chime in and, you know, it was what it was. So I think fast forward to now, I live in El Paso, Nobody that I play with lives here, mm-hmm. um, so I, I spend most of my time uh, alone writing. And some of these songs are 10 years old. Like the song Believe, I wrote, I actually wrote it for Sleeper Car, and I could never finish it. Um, and then it was just kind of on my demo list, and I showed it to David, who produced the record. And he's like, this is a great song. Why isn't this on the record? I was like, oh, it's, it's not a quote-unquote Sparta song. And he was like, what is a Sparta song? Like, what does that mean anymore? And so then we had to go into this sort of whole new state of mind. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a lot of time with David just sort of like talking about this stuff, which is sort of a new experience. It was less like it's way less band and it's more collective, if that makes sense. So there's multiple players on it. There isn't there's not really a core band anymore. It's um, basically if if Matt is OK with it, then it's a Sparta thing. <laughs> that's the only that's the only rule. If he's not, then it's a me thing. Yeah. So I think that's like the, the biggest difference is just sort of where I'm at and how that shows in the music and i know there's been some good reaction and there's definitely been some i've taken some heat on the social media for some of the stuff which is okay you know that i always tell people like you're allowed to not like this it's fine i know that some of the stuff has some of the sparta stuff has memories for people and is part of their life at a certain time and they want that to stay the same and i totally respect that so, so what would be the complaints about that? Uh, uh, again, coming back at, to a project 14 years later, I would have to imagine it would sound different. Like I, I feel like I've read you talking about how a lot of this started because you wanted to write heavier music again. And if that's the case, like, and, and I don't even know if that's what they're complaining about, but the, that would it would seem to me that would mean something different, you know, in 2020 than say like cut your ribbon heavy. Right, and I think that's the main thing is like people will somebody that just discovered wiretap scars you know, maybe a year or two ago, that's their frame of reference. The same as when I was, when I was 14 or 13, well, probably, never mind, I was probably like 12, um, and discovered Minor Threat. I mean, they were long gone by the time I was 12 years old. But to me, that was current and it was realistic. And it was like, so I can understand how people will make that kind of like, whoa, this is not the band that I thought it was. And, and that's, that's totally okay. But it's, I think that that would, that has been like the, You know, this is too Americana or this is too whatever, you know, to be Sparta. And I think that was mostly the first thing that we put out, which was Believe, which, again, was a 10 year old song. And and that's what the label picked to put out first. And I thought that was really interesting. And you guys are allowed to make that decision. And if I have an objection, I'll object. But I think at the end of the day, like, let's listen to the, the people that are listening to it subjectively and figure out what they want to do and go along with it. But, you know, it's kind of. I guess, I don't know, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but when we put out Wiretap, I was, I really wanted Air to be the single, because I knew that that would get the biggest push. Uh-huh. The first single was going to get the biggest push, and this was like coming out about the drive-in, and we would have all this attention, and I really thought that that was what we were going to, that's what I was writing, um, and it felt like that was the the song that represented me that, that day, and I sort of lost out that vote, and it was Cut Your Ribbon, which was way more heavy and over, like, just beating you on the head kind of song, and it's fine, but if you look at what's happened in the last 20 years, Air is the song that people will refer to yeah. a lot for that record. Uh, and I think it's because it has a longer shelf life, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. And, and, and props to that. I mean, that's I, I'm still in love with that record. I put it on, you know, leading up to this interview and just, God, I, it's a different conversation, but uh, that's a classic that I'll never get tired of. I'll say that about it. And it was, it was, I mean, just to touch on that for a second, like imagine that's your first record. Mm-hmm. That's the first full length I ever sang on that I ever wrote vocals for at that level, lyrics for at that level. And it, it totally didn't dawn on me until much later on sort of what that, what that pressure was taking its toll on. And I couldn't see it at the time because I was young and hungry and like, you know, I'm going to prove to the world I can do this, <laughs> whatever. And then you look back on it and you sort of go like, oh, that's, that's what comes with, with age, right? Is this wisdom and this ability to sort of look back on that stuff. And that's what's altering these songs. Like that's what's making these songs is being able to look back on those times, and reflect on them and then write and sort of go from there. Makes it interesting then for the timeline. And, and I'll, I'll point back to, you know, some of the fans who may have had a, 
questionable thoughts on it and everything too. Because if believe was, you know, so believe is from ten years ago. That's sort of like that's exactly what the next Sparta record could have sounded like from the beginning. Is, is what we're hearing now. Yeah, yeah, essentially. And I think that I would have faced. I mean, the re- and I'm I pretty. I think I've talked about this before um, without like throwing any negatives on anybody else. Like in 2009, I think it was 2009. I took a break from Sparta strictly because I was just tired of losing votes. Like it was a democracy, but I just kept losing. Like every time we would have a decision and I would have an opinion, it, it would not be the opinion of the majority of people. So I got really tired of it. And I think it was a, a good time to just go home and, and do something different. And I was able to, because I left then, I was able to sort of put it in perspective and relax and understand that it wasn't anyone against me or anything like that. It was just everybody's trying to figure out how to live their life. And I'm glad that I left then. I'm glad I took a break then because I think it would have at some point just destroyed friendships or me or something. It was really crucial to sort of stop and just say, okay, like there's no amount of money that makes this worth it, mm-hmm. honestly. And I'm sure a lot of people say that, but playing in a band is is great. And I love making music, but for me, the number one thing is creating. It's writing songs and making sounds, recording stuff, writing lyrics, sort of going on these imaginary journeys that lead to records being made. And then secondary is playing live because I'm a social person and I love to spend time with people and playing live is fun. And obviously there's some amount of ego in there that, you know, it is what it is. But the fame and fortune part has never, ever, ever been anything but shitty to me. It's never been something enjoyable. I don't have, I just don't, it's not in my DNA to want that. And so when, when that's the decision, like you need to do this in order for this to happen, I automatically will just do usually the opposite of what makes sense. <laughs> Cause I'm like, fuck that. I don't want anything to do with any of this. And it's not punk rock and it's not, it's not, it's not cool. And it's not like uh it's not like something I would brag about. I think it's, it's, probably hurt people around me because of that but i also think as you get older you figure out how to navigate that stuff better and i and i just like i think at this point i've sort of figured out what makes me okay to do this stuff and and a lot of that is when you're young you just i mean one nobody talks about mental health around musicians at all in fact we're fed drugs and alcohol to sort and i and i honestly believe a lot of times you're fed that so that you're complacent you sort of go along with what's happening. And, you know, as long as the party's there, you're not really looking at the, the bottom line and seeing who's getting paid and what percentages are. And, you know, it's, it's easy for labels and management to suggest you're on a bus because if you're on a bus, you can do more shows. Of course, you don't realize that a lot of people are getting paid before expenses. So you're, you're playing more shows. You're making less money, but other people are making more money. And as long as you're at a party every night, you kind of just don't think about it. And then that stops. And then all of a sudden you know, management and label are moving on to other bands and you're sort of home and, you know, hoping you have a home and trying to figure out how you move on and you're in your 20s. And it's the same story over and over and over and over again. And I'm sure somebody was warning me, but I wasn't listening, you know? It, um, for the first time, I think, I- I- at least in the past couple of years, I'm hearing about more bands taking control of that time, saying... The cycle, I can't stay on it. You know, the the record, tour, right, record, tour, right, et cetera, et cetera. I, I am finding that a lot of bands, the words mental health are coming up in, in so many interviews to a point where, you know, no, it's a business and, and will probably never beat it uh, in that sense, especially, you know, the, the, the more famous a person gets, I'm sure the harder it is to, to get out of that, although you do see, and I, I'm talking like the upper, upper tier, like somehow someone like Adele figured that out really early. You know, she seems to have gotten that. But but I do see a lot of indie bands that are trying to take control of that a little bit more um, now. But it, I feel like and, it, and, 50 years it's taken, 60 years, you know. And I would guess part of that is that there's not the money that there used to be. So right. when, I, when I signed this deal currently, which I signed basically as a solo artist, first record being Sparta, I don't really know. What's, I couldn't commit to anything past one Sparta record because we'll just see what happens with life. But I signed a multi-record deal, and I and I made a joke when we were recording. I said, "This is our entire budget is what we used to spend on lunch, and it's not a joke. It is literally our lunch budget that we used to use when we'd be, you know, spending a couple of hundred grand making a record. And and how at like 25 did I not understand how much money that was yeah. and question where it was going? But I didn't. So now, without all of that sort of the perks around, then I think bands are probably starting to say like. Hey, look, I can 
I can go and tour and play shows and sell records and come home with a couple of hundred bucks, which is fun. Or I could just get a job and make thousands of dollars and, you know, what's the point kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that when you start realizing that it's fine that it's a business, There's, I have no problem with this being a business. I just have a problem with myself for not realizing that I could be in control or at least be a bigger part of the business than I was before. Now I actually run businesses like I have a restaurant and we've had a venue and we've had a recording studio and we've done all these things. And it's not that I've been super successful at like the financial part, but the educational part has been tremendous. So like I can look at a tour now and say like, let's do this. It makes more sense. Everybody makes this. Here we go. Like there's a budget. We talk about it. It's not... It's like it used to be used to get shamed if you asked how much money was being made in a band. And that's not bullshit. That's totally true. You would say like, well, how much are we making on this tour? And everyone would be like, you you don't ask that. You don't ask that question. Like, that's for them to worry about. And after a while, you start going like, why is it for them to worry about? Because I feel like I'm the one that's just dying out here. And I don't want to just complain. You know, I would rather I'd rather do something different. And I don't want to be out here and like what does Ben Fold say? Like, nobody likes a belly aching rock star. Like, <laughs> right. nobody wants to hear someone on stage be like, I'm miserable, because that's not what you're there for. So I got to the point where I was miserable, and I just left. And I had this I had this interesting, I started doing this Patreon thing, because we obviously have a lot of bills to cover while these tours get postponed. And so I'm just trying to figure out some way of doing something. And I just ask everybody who joins, like, send them a personal note, and then just ask them, like, what do you want to see? And And somebody sent me an interesting note that was like, I just want to hear like the true stories. I just want to know what's, what's real. And that to me is like, cool. This is a good platform where I can talk about it. And we could talk about the stuff like a mental health. Like there's nothing wrong with going to therapy. I tell fans all the time when they write in and say like, Oh, you got me through this really tough time. I say, yeah, music's really helped me too. But please remember that there's people that are professionals that, that actually do a really good job at this. And there's nothing wrong with it. And I try to make it more, at least for me, be, you know, find that line between being honest and forthcoming and also having a personal life and, and not being just like uh, saying anything for attention. Right. Trying to find that world, you know. While you're talking about Patreon, I know that was kind of part, as you said, of, of figuring out what to do next. Uh, and, and what we're talking about here is, of course, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, how it's just it's totally shut down with the entire world, not even just the music industry. But yeah. as someone, you know, so here you are, you're launching an album. You are, you know, you had to put the tour on hold. As you said, you have a restaurant. Like, what what has it been like having this happen and and I think you you said somewhere like it's not like you had a plan B as you're launching this record like it was only plan A's so so yeah, what's we had a bunch of plan A's <laughs> yeah so what's that been like and what are you doing now so it's um I mean the the long and the short of it is it's devastating and there's no way around it it's mentally draining it's emotionally draining it is has been financially I mean beyond draining it's amazing what like ten days will do so ten days basically. Uh, 10 days without any of the stuff working is just everything comes to a grinding halt and all your reserves and all your plan, like all your safe, everything's just gone. And I don't know how we, we get through it. And sort of the, the other side of that coin is like, everybody's going through it. So there's a part of you that's like, okay, this is real bad, but this isn't because I messed up. This isn't because I did something wrong. This isn't because I, I didn't work hard. This isn't because life is unfair. Like this just is. And there's a real sort of calm to that. I think also for people like me, it's really important to not like self-medicate times like this. So one of the things we have at the restaurant, it's a bar restaurant. So I go in and I go to work and there's, you know, everything you could ever want to drink. And and you have to go and say like, okay, let's not get numb, you know, like, let's just, let's get, let's get through this and figure it out because we're not going to do anybody good if we all just, you know, party our way through this. And What can we do about it? I mean, rent's due on the first of the month. Obviously, nobody's paying their rent in my industry, right? Right. Um, Those landlords have a mortgage. Those landlords have families. I mean, it's it's just gonna it's chaos and it's it's insane. And it's you know everyone keeps saying like this is unprecedented. Like yeah, we're well past that. (laughs) Like this is a this is a new day. This is gonna change everything in my book. So I don't know. I mean, maybe it was maybe maybe. We just kind of have to stick it out and see 
how it goes, but I'm, you know, my first priority above a record or anything else is making sure that my crew, both band and, and restaurant are, I'm doing everything I can for them. I mean, we're kind of at the end of that rope, but you know, making sure that those last few payrolls go through, making sure that you sort of don't hoard your cash. You just spread it out as much as you can amongst the people that also need to pay their bills. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go from there. So, you know, what's the worst that can happen? It's, it's, it's gone. Right. Um, That's the worst. That's the worst thing that can happen. Like, you know, hopefully as many people as possible stay healthy. And if you do get sick, you're, you're able to get treated because we're not all getting sick at once. Statistically, most of us are going to get sick. Statistically, most of us won't even know it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. So I think we just, you know, this might be the benefit of being 43 at this time is like, there's a part of me that can sit back and sort of take this and process it and do a better job than if I was 23, I'd just be losing my mind, you know? Right. I'd be absolutely losing my mind. So now it's a bit more of like, all right, I mean, what are they going to do? There, there's no way that the mortgage companies are going to take all of our houses because there's nobody to buy them. Right? right. Right. There's no way that this restaurant is going to get bought out by another restaurant and, you know, they're not going to take over our spot next month because we can't pay. Like there's nobody to do that. So you just sort of put it in perspective and, and hope that that you sort of surround yourself with people that you love and things that you love and, and just get on with it. That's, 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 I, I'll echo your uh, part there about the, you know, the one moment that makes it a little bit more calm is knowing that it's not just me and it's not just a bunch of people. It's 8 billion people basically yeah. in the entire world. You know, so, yeah. so if everybody stops, then eventually – you know, hopefully as, as many as that 8 billion as the, were the ones to stop, get to go again, you know, when, when it all cranks forward and, and everything churns slowly back into some semblance of um, uh, productivity for us all, I guess. But uh, that's, it's knowing that. It's, it's knowing that everybody, everybody is there. Yeah. And this gives you, this is a, this is your, everybody who's alive and cognitive right now, this is your opportunity to be the person that you want to be because, there's a real opportunity and there's going to be some real opportunities to take advantage of people coming up pretty soon. And there's going to be some real opportunities to do good for the world and treat people well. And I, I honestly believe we're going to see some shining examples of humanity. I'm sure we're going to see some terrible stuff, but I, I really think that the people who, you know, the people that I identify with it, when you wake up in the morning, you're, you think, you know, what can we do? Not what can we take, but what can we do? I think that that will be life changing for a lot of people. I like your optimism, and and I believe in your optimism, but I also will uh, apply that to the record uh, as well uh, on Trust the River because it's interesting now hearing that, you know, Believe was written so long ago and seeing that Miracle was basically written on the fly in the studio in a way. Yeah, and I thought optimism doesn't run too thick even before this was happening in the past few years, uh, especially. And to see that these were the thoughts coming out of you that was sort of like I, I, as as interviewers, as hosts, as, as people that are critics and everything. I, I think a lot of times we sort of force threads looking for themes of nothing else just to talk about. But I do wonder yeah. if when you're looking at all this stuff, bookends like that, maybe it's coincidence. But, you know, is, is there a little bit of kismet at play here as well? It's definitely not coincidence. And I would attribute 100 percent of that happening to David Garza who, if you know anything about him, is like a shining light of humanity. He's a beautiful human being. He's a fantastic musician, and he's a great producer. But more than that, the reason I made this record with him and and talk about budgets, he made the record for a lifetime of being able to eat at my restaurant. That's how much I paid him, <laughs> which is like whenever he's in town, he gets to eat at the restaurant, which he would have anyway. But yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, that that was his fee. And I asked, I asked him, how much will it cost for you to produce? And he said, how about just food at Eloise? And I was like, it's okay, sure. <laughs> sure thing, man. Like that will, that fits the budget. So when we were talking about it and, and it's not like every song I brought into the record was fit that right. he just was really good about me, not even thinking what he was doing, but he was definitely curating this record from the beginning, from the demos until stuff that we recorded. But then when he listened to it, he has a real ability to understand the vibe of something, not in a cheesy way, but in a real, like he understands all of the, the subtle undertones that are happening lyrically musically and he'd be like you know i don't think this is the right i don't think it's the right time for this song and i'd be like okay like i think this song is great but whatever and then when i listened to the final 10 songs that I, I got it like oh he took all the negative stuff out he took all the the, the me 
you know, being a bellyache and rock guy, <laughs> taking all that stuff out. And I didn't even know he was doing it, but he did it. And, and the reason the record's called Trust the River, that's something he said when we were talking about our careers. So I've had this pretty weird life, super blessed and super lucky in a lot of ways, but also a lot of ups and downs and sort of have come in and out of these things. And he said, you know, it's just it's just like being on a river. I mean, you just got to trust the river. And sometimes it's shallow and slow, and sometimes it's rapid. Sometimes you get hung up in a tree. You know, sometimes you get beached. It, it happens. And you just kind of have to trust that, that this is life, and you just go with the flow, and you do what you can. And, and from there, just sort of let it go. So that's, that's why the record's called that. And I think it was a, a bizarre recording experience. I don't know if you know how it came about, but we went to do uh, – I just went to record bass and drums at – Sonic Ranch, which is like the big studio mm -hmm. near El Paso, mostly because they have great gear and, and I love it. I've been making records there a long time, but I could definitely not afford to make a whole record there. And we went, started on a Friday and our manager Juan flew in on Monday morning to sort of see the progress of things. And I picked him up from the airport and, and told him like, I have two more vocals to do and I'm done with the record. Like it's, it's totally done. And that wow. has never happened to me in my life. Right, right. So essentially we made a 10, I mean, we recorded 14 songs, but we finished the record and, a, it, and I don't work past, you know, like nine o'clock at night because I don't, we still have to drive an hour home from the studio. So we really made this record in like 20 hours, probably at the most, 25. It was crazy. Yeah. And I've, again, like I've never experienced anything like that. And I can only give credit to David for just sort of being this ma magical guide. It was bizarre. You, you put a lot of trust i think in a lot of friends too and that's that's actually encouraging to hear you talk about that uh i, I know uh, jim adkins from jimmy eat world plays a role in passing some demos over uh carlos uh Arvalo from chicano batman yeah. like like it, you you mentioned it earlier like sparta anymore is a collective as much as anything in that way it is it is in, in and that i think that's probably the biggest difference between uh 14 years ago and now is that there's sort of one one captain of the ship, which is me. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get comfortable with that. But I also found when I took on that role and explained it to the people around me, it made me more confident and it made me a better leader, if that makes sense. I fully understand what is happening at all times. And if I don't, I stop and figure it out. But for the most part, it's like, I can send a song to Jim and say, what do you think? And he's like, honestly, it's, it's, it's a pretty bad song, <laughs> which is what he told me. Right. Um, maybe, maybe save this part. And we ended up throwing the whole thing out. And I, I, I don't know if you know the reason we call it miracles. You just off the cuff said, if, if you find a, a melody in this song, it's a miracle. Cause it just wasn't a good song. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't see it at that point, but I trust him and we've been friends a long time. And so it's, it's I, I trust him. And then uh, Carlos is a new friend of mine, but being able to just say like, Hey, would you want to play on the song and just sent it to him and he sent it back. And, and there was a couple of things with that. Nicole who sings all over the record is a, a great, great, great musician. And it's sort of the freedom of me being able to on a whim, make these decisions and go and explore these things has been pretty refreshing. And I, and I think personally that the, the results are good. So I'm happy, I'm happy that those things are happening. This may have been talked about before and I apologize because I, I didn't actually find it when I looked for it, but, uh, I'm not crazy. All the artwork of all four albums represents they tie do they tie in together because there's an arc in every single one. I've never heard that before. Are you, so it's no. so it looks like it's purposefully done to me. Wiretap scar, you know, it's got what is that a phone, I guess is what that yeah. yeah. And and it's yeah. got the receiver but it, the way the shadow the hand is in front of it, it does this curl up thing, which is the th same thing the the uh, the swan does. And then uh -huh. you've got threes that does the whole arc thing, and now you have the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> like, it looks so purposeful, wow. and I thought, oh, surely he's done this on purpose. Oh, there's no coincidences. <laughs> there's really not, whether you're aware of them or not. Um, that's crazy. And it's funny because when I was talking to the, the guy who's making the, the video for Turquoise Dream, which is the final single the day the album comes out, and the video is this, has been this really incredibly intense process that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and sort of finally had this long enough arc to do it. And we were talking about um, the lyrics in the song. And I said, oh, man, it's like all my stuff. It's, it's a big arc from f fear and scaredness to hope. That's, that's essentially all I write about. If you listen to my stuff, is it's always optimistic, but I, I live in a dark place. So it's that's just, I, I will probably never escape that. And I've never been a, a good enough, or not good enough, I'm just not the sort of writer who can sort of, 
go and write a song and say, well, this is what I want it to be. And this is what I made, you know, I hear what's hot on the radio. I'm going to do it like this. Like I've never been able to do it. It's just 100% emotional vomit <laughs> for me to like, just get it out of my system and move on. So when we were talking about it, you know, the artwork appealed to me. I sent the, I sent the record to Cynthia. She lives in, I think she lives in Chihuahua now. She lives somewhere in Northern Mexico or if she's from Chihuahua. She might live somewhere else because I like her, her watercolor stuff that I saw on Instagram. So I sent it to her. And the reason I had her information is she wrote me and said, you, you know, one of your records got me through my mother passing away. And, and I just want to say thanks. And, you know, I wrote her back and said, thanks for letting me know that. And then I started checking out her art and I said, would you want to, would you want to do the artwork for this record? And that's how it and it's, That's what she sent was, I guess it fits, in, it fits into everything. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. I, yeah, it's a weird. I mean, there is no coincidence, but yeah, it's yeah. weird. You had, you know, kind of on this uh, a topic too. Uh, you you had mentioned recently, I think it was on Patreon, um, that you've also been into visual creation yourself a lot, or or interested in it at least. I was wondering what exactly that meant, and I think what you were talking about is the plans you had maybe for the tour that currently isn't happening. So it was actually for the. Um, so we had rented, or we had. I mean, I guess we had rented, it's all gone now, but a theater at Alamo Draft House, which is like mm-hmm. our, our, I don't know if you know what those are, but you can oh, like yeah. eat and drink at these big movie theaters. Um, and we were, we're showing the, the sort of the making of video that, that James did, who also did the Believe video. Mm-hmm. And then all the, all the songs on the record were going to have these visuals to them. So we had been working on like some, some pretty cool stuff. And now it's, we're trying to figure out how to do it live and we just can't like, it's not going to happen, but instead we'll just sort of put out what we have and, and do like a Q and a, I think the night that the record comes out, we're going to try and just do like a live stream. So people have the chance to listen to it and then you can just sort of ask me questions or whatever on how are we figure it out. But I've been sort of just getting more and more into just making little video snippets or whatever. I've always liked doing that stuff, but now it's kind of so easy on your, on your laptop that just kind of learning how to do it more but i think there's probably like some some sort of uh podcast kind of thing coming on patreon where i have like a pretty varied interest so i'd like to sort of where those things overlap i'd love to sit and talk Mm -hmm. with people i think again that's part of what comes with being 43 i'm way less interested in myself i'm more interested in other people and what they're saying and that conversation i like to learn from them so I think that's sort of what I mean by by visual stuff. I, the tour is going to be, uh, assuming it happens at some point, is going to be really stripped down, really small clubs, um, sometimes multiple nights. But for the most part, I'm just going to little rooms, places I haven't been in a long time, like bottom of the hill. I just want to go and play little sweaty rooms. That's, that is, when we sat down and talked about the tour and we talked to our agent, we looked at sort of all the, the options. There's There's bigger rooms with more money, and I just feel like I would be isolated and... It's just not what I want to do. So I want to do sort of smaller, multiple nights in places and, and sort of hang out with people and, and do fun stuff in those cities and not just be on a bus all the time or right. a van or whatever. I love that. And hopefully I'll be able to experience that myself. You, you know. But we have, no, we have no end to the tour. That's the other thing. There's no, there's no end. Right. So we can keep doing this forever if we want to, just playing, you know, five to ten shows a month. That's all I want to do. Dylan's never ending tour. That's sort of the uh, the yeah. idea there. It never goes. That's stripped down. I, I want to throw a quick compliment too. The I think I think we mentioned like every record on here except for uh, except for Quiet in the Valley, and uh, uh, that's another one. No question here. Uh, I'm just telling you how much I love that. I was oh, um, I was singing My Town earlier. I've never been to El Paso. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> I sing that song. It's so damn catchy uh, all the time. Oh, like, thank you. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. Those are all real places here. That was a, a really easy song to write. And I ended up playing it a bunch. Um, when we had the shooting, people kept asking me to come to these like rallies and stuff and play that song. And it was such a weird thing. So there's the joy of like, when I would play it, it would make people happy as happy as we could be in the midst of this insanity. But for me, it was so gut wrenching to play. And there's, there's a documentary that's coming out next year that was happened to be here. They're kind of following our congresswoman. Um, so they were here when the shooting happened and they interviewed her and they're at, at a rally. And so they actually, the guy who's doing the turquoise dream video was doing editing on it. So I went in to check out the progress on the video and he said, Hey, can I get your approval on this? So I sat in their, their sort of theater and watched 
10 minutes of this documentary with the director and was just sobbing. Like you think that you've dealt with it. Yeah. Not even close. Wow. It's so crazy. But to go back and watch that, that song sort of is now permanently uh, encased in that moment. So those are, that's one of those songs I don't think will probably ever come out again live, at least in a way, because it's just, it, for me, it will forever be that. Uh, I just used all of my energy, <laughs> like <laughs> all of my energy that that song ever had in those like, few weeks i'm okay I, I, at least I, you gave us two versions of it anyway so it's you know if i don't ever yeah, hear it live it's fine <laughs> oh. and, and it's on the documentary so yeah at least right part of it right that was a great one broken songs i remember that uh, anyway that was a that was a great record as well i love what you do if you haven't figured that out i'm a big fan so. no I, I appreciate it thank you this whole like last few months of announcing the record and then sort of being on social media you know at, at a at a growing level it's been pretty awesome because you just sort of forget that that part of your life exists. I got a message from somebody this morning that was like, hey, I just wanted to tell you that, uh, you know, I love your stuff. Just had a son four weeks ago. Every time he cries, I start, I learn decades. Uh -huh. um, and I, and the minute I start playing it, he calms down. I just wanted to tell you that. And I was like, so there's this baby in Germany that's four weeks old that is that is soothed by something I wrote. Like, it, that's, that's unreal to me. Yeah. And it's, it's so not loft on me. I'm I'm so fucking humbled by all of this stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. As we said, eight billion people in the world, and you're affecting people all the way out there. That's that's the best. You're right. That's the best. It's it's a it's the best compliment that I could hope for. Yeah. Is that it, this means something to people? That's all I want. Well, it certainly does over here. Uh, and uh, and follow the river again is uh is one of the greats in here. I, Jim, I appreciate the music. I, I sincerely appreciate uh, the the call and the the talk today with all of this. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to get easier uh, for any of us. I don't know what the future holds, but uh, I'm so happy that we have this music. Ah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think what you do is really important. You probably don't see that, but being able to have somebody that offers some calm and and entertainment and knowledge and and not just yelling at you is 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 something something good so thank you for doing what you do oh thanks man i do appreciate that uh dude it's been a pleasure talking to you likewise hopefully we'll see you around at some points somewhere. definitely yeah we were, we were joking the other day that this might be the beginning of like that movie the postman where we we see each other on the trail right and i said i'm, I'm just gonna get a, a prevo covered wagon and just get out there <laughs> Um, I'd take the postman over Waterworld, you know, if we're taking Kevin Fuck Costner yeah. era <laughs> disaster movies. <laughs> For sure. At least we've all played Oregon Trail uh, to a point where, you know, we can figure out how this goes a bit. <laughs> Plus, it's just a better movie. It's true. It's true. All right, man. Uh -huh. I'll let you roll. Thank you so much, man. No, thank you. Take care, man. Have a, have a good day. Right. Bye. Bye. A huge thanks to Jim Ward. The new Sparta record is called Follow the River, and it is so important that if you're able to, to support your favorite artists right now. I, I know I'm going to be buying my own copy of this one. Maybe I'll buy two. Chris, also be on the lookout. Uh, Jim Ward, he's got his uh, Patreon account as well, so you can, uh, you can hop over there. There's plenty of stuff happening and definitely worth your time. But also thanks to you, again, for listening to the interview and this episode. Uh, and again, for checking out all the episodes that we put out. If you're not a subscriber, I, I hope you like this enough. I hope you are into this interview enough that you'd like to, uh, to stay on board. Uh, again, you can find us on uh, all the usual spots, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast from. Just type in Kyle Meredith With. There's a new episode every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then after that, head to WFPK. Dot O-R-G. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres and music news and anniversary spins and bonus interviews. Again, that's WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound has your music and film news. You can also find me on all the usual social media platforms at Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. I'm about to grind coffee. Okay, sorry about that. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.